Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So in this video we are going to move to the next topic and that is the physical design, database design. Uh, for the rest of the and I have made uh, these changes in the previous lectures as well. I have written uh, the I have given the links of all the uh, lectures that we had so the two video lectures on YouTube as well as the interactive session on uh, MS Team. So you can find those here. Oh, so we are going to move on to the next uh, topic which is the physical database design and in the physical database design what we have done so far we are going to translate it into how we are going to implement this on the database system and on the machine. So what we have been doing so far is making tables, uh, you know, finding the attributes, uh, even deciding which kind of uh, attribute is going to be but we have not talked about the implementation part of it uh, that specifically related to uh, the database and the hardware we are using as well as certain other conditions uh, that are, has to do with the usability of the data how uh, the frequency of the uh, how usable the data is uh, how you want it do you want a backup do you want redundancy do you want fast access you know those are things that were not considered uh, before so in order to avoid any confusion because we have been uh, discussing different topics here is an overview of what we have done and where we are exactly so uh, we started with the conceptual design so we had a text form and from that text form we extracted nouns and verbs and we made tables and attributes and relationships and we ended up with a conceptual design. So that was the first step. So after the conceptual design, uh, the conceptual design could have been something like, uh, so if we had, uh, for instance, uh, so we had seller, and we had the buyer and so in the conceptual design what we did what we said that you know uh, one product can be bought by many customers and a buyer can buy many uh, can buy product from many sellers so this was a many to many uh, relationship at the conceptual level and so then we moved on to the logical level in fact we can also have a a relationship over here which is maybe product for instance so a seller is selling product to a buyer and a buyer is buying product from a seller so on the logical model we said okay you know this is going to be we have going to have a you know a seller ID and the seller details so this is going to form our first table and then we are going to have a buyer ID and other information about the buyer and this is going to be our uh, second table and this many to many relationship will form into a new table which has the seller id and the buyer id along with other uh, attributes so in this case uh, this is the primary key in this case uh, this is the primary key and here the combination here will be the primary key so from this was uh, the conceptual model and this was the logical model and after we had the logical design then we uh, analyze the schema we remove the first normal form second normal form third normal form and maybe this will be broken down into two or you know something else uh, will happen here and we arrived at the normalized schema so this is where we are right now uh, that's what we have done in the last uh, videos so from here now you need to so this is just on paper you need to have to implement this on the physical machine and for that there are certain considerations that you have to take into account before you implement it on the machine and in this video we are going to look at those considerations and then how you will transform this logical to normalized schema so from here we end it up here from this normalized schema we are going to have the physical considerations and then uh, make the 
uh, it's not an, it's a physical design here. So I'm going to write a physical design. So the purpose of the physical database design is to translate the logical design of the data into the technical specification of storing and retrieving a data. And our goal here is to create a design for storing data that will provide adequate performance and ensure database integrity, security and recoverability. So we are concerned with these things, integrity, the security, the recoverability and adequate performance. So this cannot be measured in the logical design and this will only be measured when you go to the physical implementation of whatever you are trying to design. So the balance between efficient storage and processing speed. So this is also uh, these attributes or these considerations have a kind of a trade off. So if you are going for a very efficient storage, it may not perform very well in query processing. And if you are going for a very efficient query processing, it may take up more storage. So it's a balance between how you, uh, you know, how you adjust the two things. So efficient processing tend to dominate as storage is getting cheaper. So normally uh, the storage is, uh, you know, it's a balance. So in this, uh, you know, I have this. So this is a weighing scale. Uh, oops. So we have uh, our efficiency here and we have our storage here and then this is getting cheaper. So this is being given uh, more importance. So in the physical design process here are our set of inputs and they lead to these decisions. So we have the normalized relations, maybe the third normal form. Uh, there are some new things that we will add to the physical design process. And we said that we are going to look at physical considerations. So this is one of those physical considerations. How much a table is accessed, how many times it is accessed, what is the size of the data that is being accessed and what is the size of the estimated size of the table. So if you are making a table, will it contain a few hundred rows or will it contain a few million rows? That is of utmost importance to us when we are moving from the logical or the normalized schema towards the physical design. Then we have the attribute uh, definition and uh, the second important thing here is uh, the response time. So if I have five queries and one query is you know used once a week and another query is used every hour. If I have to optimize, I'm going to try to optimize the query that is used every hour instead of optimizing one that is used once a week and maybe you can run it at night and get the result in the morning and uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, so you don't need to really optimize that as compared to something you need to optimize which is happening very frequently. So for instance, I'll give you an example. If I want to look at how my business is going or how I will, uh, how my business will perform in the next year, I want to perform an analysis query. It's not something I do on a daily basis. Maybe I'll do it uh, quarterly or semi-annually and I can wait. If I want to do it, so I can say, okay, let me put that query on Friday evening and on Monday morning when I'm back, the query would have run even if it takes 24 or 36 hours. And on Monday morning, I have my results. As opposed to if you go to a, a chain store and you have to buy something, so you need that uh, salesperson to be very, to be able to uh, deal with this transaction effectively. You cannot scan a product and wait for 20 seconds for that project, process, uh, product to register. You need that instantly. So. In some cases, you can wait 24 hours. In some cases, even 20 seconds is too much. So the expected response uh, time, that's of critical importance when you are uh, transi transitioning from your uh, third number form to your physical design. Then we have security needs. Security needs is if I have a database of my store, uh, it's pretty unlikely if I have a small store, maybe it's a good store. Uh, you know, nobody is interested in that, in this data. Uh, as opposed to that, if I have a bank database, then everybody will try to hack that data 
and try to insert uh, all kind of malicious codes there or even uh, you know uh, take it down so a uh, same goes for the integrity expectation so this is also important and then the technology used what uh, what software i'm using and what hardware i'm using and all these inputs would lead to certain decisions what are the attributes type i have what will be the physical record uh, descriptions what's the file organization am i using indexes and uh, what architecture i'm using and how i'm going to optimize my query so we'll look at uh, those things uh, one at a time so the decision involved in the physical database design include a data volume and usage analysis so that's what i said that you know what the size of the tables is it a few hundred rows is it a few million rows and how frequently is the table being accessed and on a typical query what is the amount of rows that are returned if i say select abc from table a where you know something so what is the average amount of rows that are being fetched that's the usage analysis how frequently and you know what kind of data is being returned designing fields coding techniques that's important thing controlling integrity handling missing data and denormalization this is very interesting because we just studied normalization and now we are talking about denormalization which is basically undoing certain parts of normalization so let's look at the first one the data volume and usage analysis so to estimate data volume and frequency of use statistics so statistics about the size and the usage of the data plays an important role in database efficiency additional information is added to the eer the extended entity relationship diagram so for convenience we discuss data volume and usage as if it were a one time static activity uh, so this is an uh, important thing that uh, there are two important things here the first thing is the usage analysis and the data volume is added to the er diagram so this is the first important thing you need to know so these things will come in the er diagram that's the first thing and the second thing is that we are going to assume that they are static it means if i say table a will have millions of data i am assuming that these value are going to stay there for a long time it's not going to be that today it needs million and tomorrow it need billions and the day after it need only 100 uh, that's not going to be case the case it's going to remain a uh, pretty static in practice uh, data is continuously monitored for significant changes so if i said that the, the, you know uh, this table is accessed you know once a day and i'll keep monitoring that and maybe in two or three years time my business logic has changed and now it's not average once a day but it's average once an hour then i will update the er diagram and then uh, remake the design for the physical implementation or try to find some changes that i can do uh, to incorporate uh, this change in frequency so uh, the statistics are generated by the system analytics during the system analysis phase so when you are testing when you are estimating how how frequently it's going to be used and the data volume again is an estimate of the size of the business and should be calculated uh, for the next few years it's not you know as we said it has to be static so it's estimated for the next few years so if i'm making an online store today i should you know figure i, I should take into account how my business will perform in maybe 3 years or 5 years from today and plan for that similarly the access frequency for so both the volume and the access frequencies are uh, estimated when i am performing the system analysis so when i am making you know doing my estimate of what's going to happen in the future and the access may change significantly over time and the database access can peak or dip over a day week or month but uh, the access frequency tends to be less certain even and even uh, the volume of the statistics so uh it's nothing more than estimates at this point so fortunately we don't even need the precise number the estimates are good enough so precise numbers are not necessary and uh, just the estimates uh, what's crucial here is the relative size of numbers so if i say table a is greater than table b uh, that is more important than exactly knowing whether it's going to be 200 or 300 accesses per day uh 
So, this is how you represent it. So, this is the standard ER diagram, the extended ER diagram. You can see the inheritance part over here. And in addition to that, you will see some strange things appearing which were not there before. So, we have this uh, dotted or dashed lines. There is a number over here associated with it. Uh, we have a number over here. We have certain percentages over here. And each of this also have a number. So, uh, and so on. And, you know, uh, this is a directional arrow and this is bidirectional. So, we look at what all these things mean. And as we said uh, in our uh, previous slide is that additional information is added to the EER diagram. So, there it is added to the EER diagram. So, let us try to interpret what uh, this really means. The first thing here is this. So, this is the super class or these are the two uh, subclasses or the sub tables. This is the super table and these are the sub tables. And as we saw uh, pre mid, there are different, there are in fact we studied four ways of storing uh, this kind of a relationship. So, you can have everything over here, you can have something over here and then you know uh, other things are in this tables and you can have only in this table then nothing over here or you can have a hybrid of all those things. So, there are four uh, ways we could uh, do this and we looked at if you look at your uh, lectures on a logical uh, or the ER, EER diagram, EER uh, and, and modeling. So, let us come back to what these values actually mean. So, these are the data volumes. So, what I am saying here is this is the expected size of this table. So, the part is going to be on average or what I am expecting or what I am estimating it to be. It may for instance have 1000 rows. That is what this is saying. And of those 1000 rows, since this is overlapping, it means there can be something that is both manufactured and purchased, then this is overlapping. I am estimating that 40 percent of my parts are going to be manufactured. So, 40 percent of 1000 is 400 which you can see over here and 70 percent of the parts are purchased and uh, 70 percent of 1000 is 700 which you can see over here. And as I said, they do not add up to uh, this one and the reason is there can be overlapping. So, it is actually adds up to 100 percent which uh, so, you know, when I have uh, 40 plus 70 which give me 110 and this tells me that there are 10 percent overlapping parts at least. And uh, so, this is what these uh, the first set of, of values mean and similarly over here I am estimating that the supplier is going to have 50 rows. So, maybe there are 50 different suppliers and uh, each of this supplier will have since this is a one to many relationship, I am estimating that my table for each supplier there will be 50 quotations uh, for different parts. So, 50 multiplied by 50 this is 2500 quotations. So, this one to many relationship means each supplier will have around on average 50 quotations and so, the 50 suppliers will make up 2500 quotations over here. That is what this uh, values within the tables mean. Not discussed uh, these dotted lines or dashed lines yet. So, this is the data volume. The next one is the frequency analysis and this is saying that how many accesses or how many queries will access these tables per hour or per day or per two hours or whatever you, you specify over here. Uh, and this is saying that the part table will be accessed on average 200 times per hour. And uh, this 200 times per hour, if I calculate 70 percent of that 200, this gives me 140. It means that the parts that will be accessed over here, uh, 140 of those will be purchased part and uh, the remaining of course, uh, will be manufactured part. And uh, as before, they do not have to add up. So, 40 percent of 200. So, if I had to put something over here, if I had to put something over here, this would be 40 percent of 200, which would be have been 80. And again, they do not have to add up because this is overlapping. 
So, this is the, the dashed line and the number associated with it is the access frequency, the number of queries per hour and if you are accessing the part table uh, 200 times of those 200 times 140 will be accessing the purchase uh, part and from those purchase parts we have this relationship 40 and 80 and then there will be 60 accesses uh, which access this directly and do not go through this table. So, there are 60 other uh, direct accesses to this table which do not go through this table. For the supplier table, there are going to be on average 75 accesses per hour and we see this uh, you know dotted line and this is a two way. So, uh, you have 40 percent over here or 40 accesses over here and uh, this also tells us the difference. So, how uh, purchase part is accessing this and how many times this is accessing the other way around. So, whether we are coming in this way or we are going the other way around. So, the usage analysis will be that uh, in total there are 200 accesses on the purchase part per hours which are uh, this 200 and from those uh, 80 quotations accessed from these 200 purchased parts. So, there are going to be 80 quotations that are accessed. So, when I access this uh, table 200 times of those 200 times 140 will access the purchase part and from here 80 will access the quotation and uh, from that 70 suppliers are being accessed from these 80 quotations. So, these 80 quotations that I am accessing this will result in 70 suppliers being accessed. So, this is where it initiated this resulted in 140 access to the purchase part which resulted in 80 accesses to the quotation table which resulted in 70 access to the supplier table. So, uh, when I have just like you know uh, the many part is here it means a supplier can have many quotations. Uh, so, it is on the other side supplier can have many quotations, but the many is on this side. Similarly, a purchase part will access quotation 80 times therefore, 80 is on this side uh, together with the arrow. So, this is saying from this to this this what is this arrow is indicated. And the other way around you can look at this. So, 75 uh, suppliers accessed per hour and from that we have 40 quotations and these 40 quotations will result in 40 purchase parts. So, we can have it the other way around and there is no uh, dotted line in this direction. It means uh, purchase part is the end uh, table that will be accessed. You do not go from purchase to the part because there uh, all the arrows are in this direction. So, this is the usage analysis and the volume analysis and this will help us decide how we are going to implement uh, on the physical level. So, there are 1000 part instances. So, if part have uh, many attributes and some like description are required are quite long uh, then the efficient storage of part might be important. So, if I have a part which has a 1000 accesses and you know some attributes here are quite long. So, I need and there is because they are frequently accessed I need to have a very efficient storage for that and by storage I mean do I use a hash table, do I use a B tree, uh, do I use arrays, what how do I store actually uh, that thing that is important for me because it is accessed quite frequently. So, for each of the 40 times per hour that quotation is accessed via supplier purchase part is also accessed. Therefore, the diagram would suggest possibly combining these two co accessed entities into a database table or a file. So, uh, maybe these two uh, tables should go into the same hard disk if I am using multiple hard disks or uh, maybe they should you know have the same index or maybe uh, I can denormalize that which we will look at uh, later uh, very slightly in this uh, video, but uh, that is a very detailed topic for another course which is data warehousing and data mining. So, there is only a 10 percent overlap between the manufactured and the purchased part. So, it might make sense there to have two separate tables for these entities. So, because here there is this 10 percent access. So, uh, this will give me a good indication of how I actually translate 
this object oriented design into a physical design only 10% overlap so i don't need to store the common things here i can store it uh, separately even if 10% are redundant here doesn't matter there's not a lot of overlap so further there are 200 accesses an hour of purchased part data and only 80 accesses of manufactured part per hour so it might make sense to organize tables for manufactured and purchased part uh, differently due to the significant uh, access volumes so manufactured part and purchased part you know this is also an indication that they should be uh, separate it can be helpful for subsequent physical design steps if you can also explain the nature of the access to the path uh, by the dashed line such as whether it will result in data creation which actually means is it an insert query uh, when i say it will be accessed uh, 200 times so what does this 200 means is it insert is it delete is it update or is it just uh, select so if you can add that that will be even more important but even if you can't add uh, that this is uh, good enough for our planning so the more precise the description is the more it will help you in making the suitable strategy so this is the advantage of using the map that's the first thing that we have done towards the physical design another thing is uh, designing the field so the smallest unit of uh, the field is the smallest unit of data in any application recognized by the software system such as programming language or database management uh, system for instance uh, character or integer or float or real or double or long uh, boolean what kind of uh, data type you need so the basic decision you must uh, make in specifying each field is concerned concerning the data type that you need is there going to be any coding technique and how to control the integrity or handle the missing values so uh, to design uh, the first thing you need to do is choosing the data type and for that you set of you have a set of values along with operations that could be performed on them and the correct data type to choose for a field should represent all possible values minimize the storage improve the integrity uh, means eliminate all illegal values and support manipulations so if i want to store a yes or no only so i want my data can be just yes, yes or no so if i can store it if i make the field to be an integer it means i can store 0 and 1 that's fine i can store zeros and 1 but what's the problem here the problem uh, there are two problems the first thing is the integer is going to take a uh, more space so that's the bad thing and the second thing is because it's an integer i can enter two three four five so this also is uh, a bad design so what this tells me is that integer is not the right thing to do instead i should have used a boolean value and this would have given me just zero one uh, zero one one so if i put a 2 it won't allow and because this is boolean so it will take uh, less space so this is a better design so it helps minimize the storage can represent all the possible values and will help me eliminate illegal values so this is not allowed over here so the other thing you can do is you can choose a coding technique so what is a coding technique it helps in uh, storage efficiency so for instance if my product is uh, b to 100 is the product number uh, the description is chair and uh, if i make a chair i need to store what kind of finish do i have on the chair so i could have written a birch finish a maple finish or an oak tree finish instead what i've done is i have coded it uh, this is a b and c so this would have taken a lot more space than this and just by storing C A C B, I am taking up less space, and this is only uh, reasonable uh, if uh, finished field is infrequently accessed. If this is accessed frequently, so if this is accessed a uh, hundred times or thousand times per hour, and every time I have it, because this will result in a join, I have to make a join to find these values when I am displaying it. So if it's going to be accessed 200, 500, 1000 times per hour, then uh, coding this would be a bad thing. 
however it's if it's ex, uh, you know accessed only once a day twice a day maybe three four times a day and uh, this is a very small join then okay i am saving a lot of space particularly if this table is large so i don't have to you know write these things again and again so in this way i can encode my data if this is long it's free and you know it's not frequently accessed then i can encode it and look it up in a, a lookup table so controlling the data integrity uh, for that i need to figure out what the default value is so if you are filling a form on a web page and you you know most of us just tend to skip everything that is not marked with an asterisk because that's not necessary and if i skip something uh, what data do i want to represent uh, because later when i'm calculating statistics if i don't allow for a reasonable data then that will mess up with my statistics so the default value what's going to be the default value that's a physical design characteristic uh, what's the range control the allowable values uh, null value control do i allow it or not and referential integrity so if i am writing uh, a city and if somebody says tell me the city code or the postal code so and they give me a text box so they should not allow me to just enter any enter any value instead this should go into a lookup table and you know have all the codes listed so the code and the city and only should allow me to insert allowable values so if i'm living in samba the code is 44000 i should not be enter uh, i shouldn't be allowed to enter uh, 0000 maybe if that's not a city code then i shouldn't be allowed to enter this handling missing data so when i have a missing data how do i handle it uh, the first way is to substitute an estimate of the missing value uh, maybe i use the most frequently used maybe i make a database trigger and that will decide uh, what uh, uh, you know values to be inserted uh, for instance uh, that can insert the mean value the average value or some other thing it can look at my other uh, uh, attributes and guess what kind of uh, you know for instance i miss uh, the the attribute gender and uh, i am instead i have given my height and my height is 65 and then from that you can guess that it's going to be a male and you can insert that so this can be a uh, something that you can do and then perform sensitivity analysis or missing values are ignored unless knowing a value might be significant so if i am i will be calculating things based on gender then yes i am going to make that estimate and insert it otherwise i am just going to ignore it because it's not used and finally we are going to talk about the denormalization so we mentioned here uh, we mentioned somewhere here Yeah, we mentioned that the decisions involved in physical database design involve denormalization, and so what is this denormalization? And I think we also mentioned it somewhere here that uh, things can be denormalized. So, how do I denormalize it? Let's uh, move to the denormalization. So, denormalization is the normalized relation solve data maintenance anomalies. So, the reason we studied normalization was we wanted to avoid the uh, three anomalies: insert, update, and delete anomalies. However, this may not be very good in the data processing. It may not result in very efficient data processing. So, what I can do is I can transform my normalized relation into unnormalized physical record. specifications so even after i have done my normalization if i realize that because of the normalization uh, two tables are being accessed maybe a thousand times per hour it means i have to make that join a thousand times per hour and uh, i separated them because they did not you know conform to the third normal form that's why i separated two tables but now i have to make that join a thousand times per hour maybe i will you know go back and say okay i don't want it in third normal form but if i can avoid the uh, the join then i don't want it in third normal form it's acceptable to me as it was so the benefit of that would be that it can improve performance by reducing the number of lookup tables or joins and uh, however uh, there is a cost associated with it and that is that if i have done 
you know the reason we did normalization was to remove redundancies so if i you know denormalize it means i am uh, gaining back that redundancy though my um, update will be more uh, troublesome and uh, my storage requirement will be more so the common form of denormalizations are the one to one relationship uh, one to many and the many to many relationship let's look at how it is done so for instance if i have uh, this uh, schema so there is a student that submit a scholarship uh, application form so i have one to one relationship uh, so one student can submit at most one scholarship application however uh, you know this is zero so there are going to be students that do not submit any scholarship applications but if they do uh, they can submit a maximum of one application if i transform this uh, design into a logical uh, table this is going to be uh, one table for students having the student id and the cam campus address and another table for the application which has application id the application date and the qualification so you can see here the student id is necessary the campus address is necessary application date and qualification necessary application id was made just to have a, a primary key for this table because there were none so if i want that then if i want to denormalize it i will just merge it into a single table uh, this id was created this is a surrogate key created because this uh, table did not have a no, uh, primary key so since i am merging it this table no longer exists i don't need this i can simply add the application date and the qualification back and this was needed because you had you, you had a link so you wanted to uh, make a primary key for and key link so these two uh, attributes will be dropped and the two remaining attributes will simply merge into this so this is the denormalized one to one relationship and that's the easiest thing to do to denormalize the one to one relationship so what's the drawback the drawback is for because we said some student will have application and some might not so if student uh, 0 0 1 uh, for instance is jiki campus in topi and the application date is maybe 14th uh, june 20 and the qualification was bs and then we have another uh, student that is not making this application so this is again in gq topi and this will have simply null and null and the reason we had this split in the first place was to avoid these kind of values but if this is accessed frequently maybe 500 times an hour 200 times an hour i don't want to make this joins all the time i can just denormalize it into one table and you know live with this nulls so it's a waste of storage it's, it will increase my storage but it will save me uh, the joins i have to make 200 times per hour uh, the, for the one to many relationship we have so we have the storage instruction over here so we have the instruction id the where to store and the container type and we have the many relationship which have the item id and the description this is how it looks like uh, you know once once you resolve this you always have to take the one side towards the many side as a foreign key so instruction id will move here as a foreign key we did this in the when we were discussing the logical design so if you want to uh, denormalize it you don't need this you don't uh, you simply are going to uh, merge these two things uh, from the storage size uh, you're just going to uh, move them over here so always if there is a one to many relationship uh, the only thing you can do is uh, move the one side towards the many side because the other way is not going to be possible if i have 100 and for that i have a thousand so i can replicate 110 times to make the thousand but i can't convert the thousand back to 100 so in this case uh, the many side will remain the attributes from the one side so this attribute and uh, this attribute they will move to the many side and again now this has a redundancy because you know one item will have uh, multiple uh, values over here so for each unique value this uh, the item num uh, id and the description is being repeated so this is going to increase storage 
but reduce joints so this is an example of a denormalizing the one to many uh, joint and finally we have the many to many joint and for that we have uh, you know if we have a many to many relationship so you can see the many part over here and the many part over here so a vendor is selling an item can sell many items and uh, you know have different price for that items an item can be sold by more than one vendor and each vendor will have a different price so this is how it would have been so this is a new table this is a different table and the price code is going to have uh, the primary keys of both along with the price that was the standard way to uh, uh, to convert uh, the many to many conceptual design into the many to many logical design so if i want to denormalize it what i can do is I can get rid of uh, this uh, price code, and since uh, you know these two are the uh, foreign keys, so I don't need to replicate them. What I can do is I can simply add the vendor ID here, and uh, to make a link between these two, and add the price over here. So I can you know shift the uh, the primary key of one to the other along with the new attribute. I could have done it this way, or I could have done it. The other way around. So uh, since it's many to many, it doesn't really matter. So uh, it does matter if the size, if even if it's many to many, if the size of this is you know 100 and the size of this is 1000, then yes, it would matter uh, from physical point of view how the storage is going to uh, cope with that. But it's a many to many, so you can move uh, the primary key uh, from one side to the other, and then uh, so if I want to figure out. Uh, what item was uh, you know if I want to for a given item if I want to know the price given by the vendor I don't need to go to this table I can find it directly from this table so if the description says maybe a TV so I want to find out the TV price given by uh, maybe Samsung I uh, I don't need to go through this table and make a join I can directly get it from uh, this table so those are the uh, important considerations when we are making the physical design uh, one last thing is that once we are done with that particularly if the size of the table is huge we are talking about gigabytes and terabytes of uh, rows of data the size of the table is in gigabytes and terabytes so partitioning in the database process is an important process and there can be three kind of partitioning the horizontal partitioning the vertical partitioning or a combination of both so if i have a table like this so let me put it let's have the id over here so this is the primary key attribute a1 attribute a2 so on and then attribute a uh, let us call it p so this is table a so let me call it table 1 and assume that the size of this is uh, 1 billion and the number of attribute is for instance uh, 1400 so this is a huge table what i can do is i can do two things i can do a horizontal partitioning why because if i want to access something if i want to look at if i want to make a join you know that joins are made using a cartesian product so if i have another table uh, table 2 and i make want to make a cartesian product i want to make a join so this is going to be whatever is the size of this multiplied by uh, 1 billion and uh, whatever is the number of attributes of this plus the number of attributes of this this is going to be the size of the temporary table before i start the filtering process to avoid that i can divide this table into two so or into three for instance so if i divide it into two so one to 500 million are here and uh, 500 and 
500 million plus 1 up to 1 billion over here so now if i want to make a join i'll make a join with this separately and i make a join with this separately so already i have reduced the size the second thing i can do is a vertical partitioning i can decide that this 1400 attributes are you know too many so what i can do is i can write a uh, table 1a and this table 1a is going to be id and a1 a2 so on up to a700 and this is the key over here and then have a uh, table uh, 1b again the id is replicated a701 a702 so on up to a1400 and this is so this is kind of a vertical partitioning i have partition it in this way i can either partition it in this way this is the horizontal partitioning i can do it in this way so now each of the individual table has size 700 and uh, the only thing i need to do is that i have to repeat this id so basically uh, these tables would be side by side so the first table is this this here is corresponding to table 1a and uh, this here is corresponding to table 1b and the downside is that the id has to be repeated uh, but the size of the tables is now smaller so if i wanted to make a join because i need some of these attributes i'll make a join with this part if i wanted to make a join because i needed some of these attributes i'll make a join with this table so in this way i can reduce the cost of the join and finally uh, i can have another consideration for is the data replication and this is most important for critical systems so if i'm if i am a bank i don't want to end up in a situation where i say that oops uh, my database server you know got fried and i don't have uh, information about your accounts anymore i don't want that to happen so for every data there are going to be three or four replications so when i make a transaction to a bank it's with the local branch so the local branch might have one uh, the regional center might have another the national center might have a replication and then there can be a replication which is storing this one so the data of my account might be at 2 3 4 5 different locations and if one of them fail or if there's a fire incident or something then the data can be retrieved from one of the backups that is the data replication and this also an important point when we are converting from the logical to the physical uh, design which tables are going to have a backup how often they are going to have a backup and when they have a backup then we have a big uh, data integrity issue because i don't want this to be updated and these to be left uh, the way they were so if this is updated it means everything has to be updated in real time so these are some of the issues that we consider using Uh, when we are uh, transforming from the logical design towards the physical design so i hope it is clear and uh, with that we are done with the design part of the database so we looked at the conceptual design and then the logical design and the, the normalization and finally the physical design so once you have the physical design you just go and implement it on your uh, whatever database management system you have chosen and whatever hardware you have chosen the hardware could be a simple hardware could be a redundant or a raid based or a you know, distributed system so that will uh, require another set of uh, you know constraints but we're not going to talk about that in this course so that's it for uh, this lecture if you have any questions you can ask me either on the youtube comment section or uh, on the ms team or Uh, during the question answer session we'll have on friday morning so that's it for this uh, thank you very much